All right, let's all gather in, grab our hymnals, and stand the same page number 84. Number 84. out this morning. Hope everybody's feeling well. All right. Let's don't forget that on August 8th through the 11th, we're going to have Brother Brian McBride with us. We'll make plans to be here for each of those services. And we'll be at 7 p.m. each night. All right. Birthdays this week. Yeah. Miss Ella. How old is Ella now? Four? Oh, wow. All 
All right, let's sing happy birthday to Miss Ella. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. All right. If you have your bulletins, look at the bottom on the right-hand column or right page. Let to see. If you want to know how rich you simply take it, Everything that money c cannot buy and add it together and everything death cannot take away. That is a quote from Amen. Brother D Dr. Adrian Rogers. He's a good man of God. All right, ladies, y'all singing? Happy Physicians tried in vain for twelve long years of pain is proof that there is nothing they can do. But I just heard somebody say, There's a healer on the way. Somehow I have to press my way through. Gotta get to Jesus, gotta get to Jesus. I know that he's the answer to my needs. Bring him all my problems, only he can solve them. In the broken pieces, gotta get to Jesus. My world is torn apart. I need healing for my heart. I really don't know how much more I can take. Trapped inside a cloud of disbelief and doubt. I only know one way of escape. I've got to get to Jesus, gotta get to Jesus. I know that he's the answer to my needs. Bring him all my problems, only he can solve them. Mend the broken pieces, gotta get to Jesus. If the hem of his garment is all I can reach, I know if I touch him, I will be free. I will be free. I've got to get to Jesus. Got to get to Jesus. I know that he's the answer to my needs bring him all my problems only he can solve them mend the broken pieces gotta get to Jesus bring him all your problems only he can solve them mend the broken pieces so many Gotta get to Jesus. Gotta 
Gotta get to Jesus.
tries to come rushing in like a flood there's one thing that holds me I'm trusting the blood I'm trusting the blood Jesus gave for my sin. It still has the power to heal and to cleanse. God's mercy is flowing. In one crimson flood, I'm washed and made whole cause, I'm trusting the blood. Jesus won a great victory that day on a tree. And he said in his name, I could claim it for me, for all of my needs. He is more than enough. So I'm looking to And I'm trusting the blood. I'm trusting the blood. Jesus gave for my sin. It still has the power to heal and to clean. God's mercy is flowing in one crimson flood. I'm washed and made whole cause. I'm trusting the blood. God's mercy is flowing. One crimson flood I'm washed and made whole I'm washed and made whole I'm trusting the blood Trusting the blood Trusting the blood Amen. Thank God for the blood. Without it, we'd all be headed for hell. So I appreciate the Lord and the blood that he shed for us. The book of Ruth this morning, chapter number one. That's page 315 in an old school field if you carry one of those. If you don't, might be in there somewhere close to that. Comes right out to the book of Judges. Good study when you study the book of Ruth. Most preachers at some point in their life will go through and do a large study in the book of Ruth. It's a great book. It's a book about ruin, repentance, and redemption. And it has a beautiful story of romance, the right kind. Amen? So it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I want to look this morning on this thought as we study this morning. 
from misery to mending by a miracle. From misery to mending by a miracle. I'm going to give us a pretty good look into chapter number one, so we'll look at that this morning. I ask you to find your place there, and when you have, we'll stand and give reverence to the reading of God's Word this morning. In Ruth chapter number one, if you're able, would you stand with us? We'll read this in honor to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. We honor our flag. We stand and salute it. In the book of, or in the life of, uh, 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 well, I just lost it. Uh, anyway, when they was building back the tabernacle, when they was getting it all put back together, and uh, they, they come there to the reading of the word. When Ezra stood to read the word, they had a pulpit, and the people stood in the hearing and honoring uh, of the word, and that is the reason for that. So, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his sons was Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha. And the name of the other was Ruth. They dwelt there about ten years. Ten's a number of judgment when you do numerology studies. And Malion and Chilion died, also both of them, and the women was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Therefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am old to, too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should bear uh, son, also son, um, and should also bear sons. Forgive me there. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death depart thee and me. And when she saw that she steadfast, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left her speaking. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass as they were come to the city that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? She said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Myra, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why ye then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, 
which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Let's pray. Father, help me today. Forgive and cleanse and purge. Lord, use me that I might be a servant for thee today, bringing honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. May sinners hear the word and by faith, repentance toward God be saved. Father, I pray for the strengthening of thy servants. Many today are going through valleys and troubles and hardships. They need help from you, and I pray that today you'll take this thought, this message, use it for thine glory and help it unto thy servants. We ask it, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Thank you for being with us this morning. I appreciate you coming out to the house of the Lord. I pray that God will meet, as I have prayed now, that God will meet and help the needs that you have today. Well, let me give you a real quick summary. I know that you're familiar with the book of Ruth. You're familiar with the story of Miss Ruth. Uh, but I want to I want to give you a little bit of that because not everybody has always been a Bible reader. Not everybody's always been in church. So I have to be reminded from time to time that we all ain't been in this thing fifty years. I remember what Doctor Jones's wife, Miss Sandra, said to him one time. Said, uh, uh, "James, not everybody has a doctor's degree. You need to remember to keep it down here where others can reach it." Amen. That was a, a saying that Doctor Lee Robertson that had said as he taught there and had, uh, he was the, the starter of Tennessee Temple. He, in his early days, he tried to get it high and impress folks, and he realized that that's no good because folks that need it and want it can't reach it. So he then become more simplistic in his preaching and teaching that everybody could get a hold of it. Now let me give you some baseline stuff here on Miss Ruth and Miss Naomi. The story starts out much about Miss Naomi. Chapter 1 deals with where we get to the point of Miss Ruth coming back to Bethlehem, Judah. But they was there in, in, in Moab for 10 years. It shows us and impresses me that shortly after getting into the land of Moab, that her husband, Elimelech, dies. So she starts out with a pretty bad situation shortly after being gone from Bethlehem, Judah. Now, I don't know exactly how long they was gone. I know the total time is about 10 years. But in the early of it, the early of the story, you see that, that uh, her husband dies, and then her sons marry the Moabite girls. Now, if you do your Jewish study, you study Jewish history, the Moabites came from a very horrible sin. They was outcast from the people of Israel. They were not to be entertained or mingled with. And here these two Jew boys coming out of Bethlehem, Judah, have now married into the Moabites. And in a short period, they both die. So now Naomi is left there with her two daughter-in-laws in a, in a pretty horrible situation. Now as they return to the city, you notice the whole city comes out. I'm going to I'm gonna try to hurry, but I want to lay out the story so you can get a hold of the picture of someone going from misery to being mended and seeing miracles. So when you look at when you look at this Miss Naomi, she comes back to the city. The city comes out to meet them, and they say, "Is this Naomi?" So her appearance was very obvious of a lady in misery. Well, why not? She's lost her husband and two sons. She's in a terrible fix. She's in a mess. It looks hopeless for her, but there's a little measure of faith that's kindled up in her heart that has brought her from Moab back to Bethlehem, Judah. Remember, there was faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Somebody brought news to Moab that God has visited his people and there's bread again in Bethlehem, Judah. So she's got a little bit of faith to get back to Bethlehem, Judah to where the bread is and where she's supposed to be, where she needs to be. So now Naomi, when you study it out, her name means pleasant. So to look upon Miss Naomi, you see a pleasant person. You see one that comes in with a radiant smile. I mean, she's got all going for her. She's got this smooth, beautiful complexion as she approaches folks. She's named this way because of her countenance, her, her eyes that once twinkled with excitement and goals, her hair that once flowed and glittered. And I mean, she's got this wonderful appearance, but now as she returns after 10 years, away from Bethlehem, Judah, the house of God, the house of bread. She comes back in a misery look. She looks terrible. She looks awful. Now, I can't say that except for the Bible says that. You know, you never tell a woman 
If it don't look good, you don't ever say that. You change the subject. You go, you look at something else. You, you talk about something else. Oh, wow. Did you have a wonderful day yesterday? Did you, did you tend to your flowers or something? You don't ever say, golly, gal, you're looking rough today. You all right? <clears throat> you don't, you don't, uh, that's not exercising good wisdom. So here's, here's this crowd, though. They come out to meet Miss Naomi, and they throw out this statement. Is this Naomi? Because why? She is expected to be a pleasant one. Can I say something to you this morning? If you're saved by the good grace of God, folks expect you to be the pleasant one. They expect you that in a world of troubles, in a world of terror, in a world of times that we have never seen before, folks expect us Christians to be pleasant folk. Amen. Y'all smile. Listen, can I give you something this morning? You ought to smile just to make the devil wonder what's going on. Because if you walk around with that doom and gloom look all the time, he's a shouting that he's a winning. Amen. You ought to be happy. Amen. Listen, when this is over, we're in heaven. Amen. We're going to walk on streets of gold, walk through the gates of pearl that's so big we can't even, we can't even get that to fit in our little old minds. We get to be with Jesus forevermore. Hey, listen, there'll never be, there'll never be a time when you can't talk to Jesus. I'm talking about walk up eyeball to eyeball stuff. You hear me? I mean, it's going to be a wonderful thing. And then we all get to come back on stallions. For those of you who don't want to ride, you can stay and shout. That's fine. And Andy, I'm coming back on one of them stallions with him. I like riding horses. Amen. Especially one that's under God's control. Say so amen right there. I've had a few that I wondered if a devil had entered them. But anyway, uh, horses are a good thing. Anyway, here we go. Miss Naomi, she's coming back, and she's got this look of misery. Why not? She should have a look of misery. When you look at Naomi's life and you look at her descent, they went from Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread. They went from the house of bread, the house of praise. They went from a place to where she was named as being pleasant to now she's in misery. And when you, when you see the descent that took place, they left because there was a lack of bread. Now listen to me. I got some good stuff here to think about. When you, when you, when you see why they left, we automatically, anybody knows anything about Jesus knows we should exercise faith. Well, you don't have to exercise faith if there's bread and food in the cupboard, right? Well, why in the world did the Lord give us a picture of the children of Israel walking around in a wilderness for 40 years and him raining down manna from heaven and blowing in chicken from the east. So for those of you that don't know what's good food, you need your bread and you need some chicken. Amen. That's God food. Heavenly food. Amen. Amen. It's always good to have chicken. Amen. Turkey, chicken, whatever, it's all good. Amen. We like it. <clears throat> and you need some bread too. Amen. Y'all hear that? My son, my son heard that all the way over yonder and he said Amen. So when you think about this, they left because it was a likeness of bread. There's a shortage. There's a famine. Can I ask y'all a question? Did they have cupboards in the wilderness? Did they have storage bins in the wilderness? So they couldn't put up something and say, okay, we're all right now for a month. We got what we need. They couldn't take a relaxed state like you do. Come on. Most of us has got enough food around the house to get by a month or so if we had to. If you don't, then you need to go to the grocery store. <clears throat> Hello. Some of you older women are lacking in your responsibility to teach the younger women how to run a house. You think just running a man's the only thing. No, you got to run the house too. Somebody say amen right there. You need to keep the cupboards full. You need to make sure that the food's there and 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 Rather than spending it on all this other stuff, you need to make sure you got food. Hey, we may come up on some hard times in the very near future. I'm not a prophet. I don't have to prophesy when the writing's already on the wall. They're already declaring there's going to be a shortage of food in the fall. 97 distribution places that handles your food have burned over the last year and a half, two years. Get out of just Fox and NBC News and C-SPAN and, and, and CNN. Get, get in some, learn some stuff, amen? Learn some stuff. 
But the first thing you need to do is learn to be like the children of Israel, walk around the wilderness and trust God a little bit. God was faithful for 40 years to rain down manna from heaven and blow in the chicken. Right? God took care of them. There wasn't nothing they could do to take care of their self. They're in a wilderness. They can't plant tomatoes. They can't plant taters. I don't know where you're from, but around here is taters and maters. Is that right, Tennessee brother? Taters and maters. Amen. So we, 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 we know they didn't have that privilege. You don't grow stuff in the desert, in the wilderness. So they had to totally trust the Lord for 40 years. Here they're running short on bread and they decide it's time to leave the house of praise and the house of bread and go down to Moab. Now listen to me. It's never good to leave God for the world. That's the most foolish mistake that you can make. So in Bethlehem, Judah, they got a Savior there. Now they make a decision to leave the Savior for substance, for supply. <coughs> Work decisions ought to be based on the Savior and the Scriptures and His service rather than supply. Did y'all get it? I need to say it again. Your working environment should be based on the Savior, the Scriptures, and service unto Him, not on supply. I've lived by a statement I made as a young, ignorant preacher. Now I'm an old, ignorant preacher, but anyway. <clears throat> when I was young, I made a statement, I'd rather be in the will of God flipping hamburgers at McDonald's for minimum wage than to make all the money in the world and be out of the will of God. You know what I've learned? I was pretty smart back then because I still stand on that today. Not only do I say that, I have proved that because when I walked away from the sheriff's office of 11 years in a pretty good position at the time when I walked away, I was making pretty good money and I went from 35000 plus a year to $400 a week, 450 Say amen, Angela. She wrote the check. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty steep step to take. But I was, just, I was just dumb enough to believe God could handle little old Curtis and his three or four youngins to feed and a wife. She sort of fits the youngin category sometimes, so that's the reason for confusion. So you see the descent. They was trusting substance. So many people today are trusting substance instead of the Savior. God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He will not fail you. Amen. So when we, we see these mistakes made by Miss Naomi and her family, God's teaching us not to make the same mistake. Stay with God. Don't follow the substance. The substance may run out, but the Savior never will. Amen. So you see their trust in substance. You see the trying situation. They're in a, in a situation that they have not control of. You know, oftentimes we end up in misery because of our decisions we make in a situation we have no control over. You've got to understand God does some things for reasoning. See, what the problem boils down to is Elimelech had a trusting the Savior problem. When the trial came, it showed his weakness in trusting the Lord and he trusted substance and his ability to change an environment, to change a place and, and be able to do better than what he could do in that position, that place and trust in the Lord. Trying situation for Elimelech. You know what it did for Elimelech? Killed him. The Bible says he died. His decision to leave God, Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and the house of praise, his decision to leave there cost him his life. You know, the, 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 the disciples in Matthew 14 went out on the sea of Galilee and as the storm arose. How you accept and handle the storm is what makes the difference on what the storm is about. 
One, they could not control the storm. There's things coming in your life you have no control over. You can do some things. You can try to take good care of yourself. You can, you can eat right. I have a preacher friend. I'll not mention his name on the line, but I have a preacher friend that was a uh, chicken only. That's only eat me to eat and eat very little of that. He was pretty much a vegetarian except for he would eat some chicken once in a while. <coughs> he walked a treadmill 45 minutes to an hour every day. His wife worked for one of the heart doctors. In a checkup, they found that he had some blockages in one of his carotid arteries in the neck. Well, they said, hmm, we might need to see about doing something about that here in the near future. And she said, wait a minute, doc. If he's got that going on in the neck, don't you think maybe we ought to check his heart? He ended up in Baptist Hospital and had a four bypass surgery. He was doing his dead level best to be healthy, working out and eating right, and he still ended up with clogged up arteries. There's some things going to come in your life that's outside of your control. Don't mean don't do the best you can. Don't mean to be slothful. But there's things coming in your life that's outside of your control. God's got other reasons for things. So we see their descent to Moab. I've got to hurry. Trusting substance caused them to sin. They go through this trying situation. Just like the disciples in Matthew 14, we need to remember that when the waves are over our head, they're under his control. Don't let trying situations make you live the life of misery, as did Miss Naomi. God sometimes lets us go through these testings. Now, you think about her troubles and sorrows. You think about the children. One, her husband dies, so there's the, the, the loss of a spouse, the sorrow of the spouse. Then the children are sick. Then they die. Now she's sitting here with two daughters-in-laws that she really don't want much to do with. Y'all hearing me, right? She told them both to stay, stay back, and she's going back to Bethlehem, Judah, without them. So I don't know whether she's ashamed of them. I don't know why she didn't like them. You know, truth be known, most mom-in-laws don't like son-in-laws. Most daddies don't like son-in-laws much either. But there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot that goes into that because they've taken away our baby, you know. And I'll tell you, I don't care if you're 50, babies are babies. I remember, I remember Miss Johnson when she was making comment about her son Carol when he was uh, sick unto death, and she made a comment about her baby. Carol was what, 50 some, 58 year old, 60 year old? I mean, he wasn't no baby, but he was to her. So you're always mama's baby. Amen. So there's the troubles and sorrows that they dealt with. Then you got the despair of Moab. See, Moab, when you look and study what happens in Moab, Moab will drain you. Moab will, will, will take away from you things that you need. It drained her of her strength. She, she's, she's now, when you see her, she looks like a miserable woman. And that happens. That's what happens to that. What that world will do to you is it'll take your, your joy away. It'll take your happiness away. It'll take your praise away. That's, that, that world will sap you of all of your strength. It took her spouse, took her sons, took her substance. Moab will depress you. We're probably, right now, in the worst era of depression that we've ever been in. I hear more people that are depressed than I've ever been aware of in all my life. I, I, I know as a young fellow, you're running around wide open, you don't think about other people going through depression, but at this phase in my life, I see depression too much in God's people. People that are saved by the grace of God, they've got a testimony that God saved their soul and they're in depression. And it's a bad state to be. She, proof that she's in depression, verse number 11, she told them to go back. She didn't want them to go with her. She don't want no company. Now, if somebody's got to a place they don't want company, now listen to me. I'm not telling you I'm a psychologist. I hold no doctor degrees at present. But if somebody don't want nobody around, and that's the way they are all the time, they're in depression. They're discouraged. 
They don't want nobody around. They don't want nobody bringing them down. That they or, or they don't want to bring nobody else down with them. They just they just 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 leave me alone. They're in depression. There's a lot of various causes for depression. Defeats of their goals, death that come, diseases that come. There's a lot of reasoning for depression. There's an answer for depression. His name is Jesus. If you get to where you can and should be with Jesus, he can help you with that depression. He said, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. He said, I come that you might have my joy. Even going to Calvary, he said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He went on through Calvary's troubles and and all the agony and the suffering and the shame that he dealt with at Calvary because of the joy that was there in giving us eternal life, forgiveness of our sins. So, the despair of, of Moab, it'll drain you, it'll depress you. Moab will destroy you. Can I, can I say something to you about dealing with folks with depression? God help us. God help me to do better with it. But when you know somebody's in depression, when they say leave and leave me alone, don't listen to them. Be kind. Be kind. Be delicate. But don't leave them to themselves. Try to encourage them to get out and do something. Get to church, amen, singing good gospel, singing will help your heart. They can listen to all this dog left, wife left, junk on the radio, and that's not going to help them. That's why I'm a biggie on old-fashioned spiritual music because it'll work on the heart. It'll help you. It will help you. It'll minister to you. It's a ministry. Music is a ministry. It's a major help. Why did Saul call for David to come and play the music to him? Because he was in misery. He was not happy. He needed something to uplift him. And David came and played, played upon the heart the songs of God that encouraged Saul. I've told you before, it said of Elvis Presley that after his concerts, he'd call the men into the room and they'd all get in there and they'd play the old gospel hymns in order to help him out of the depression. They named him the king of rock and roll. They still had, you know he'd been gone since the late 70s, 77? They still hadn't spent all his money? Hello? Money wasn't his issue. He had all the substances he needed. But he knew the problem he had was he wasn't where he needed to be with the Lord. And at 42 years old, he's dead. Moab is a place of despair. But when you get to where she realizes what's going on, sort of like that prodigal son, when she came to herself, she said, Hey, I got word, there's bread, God has visited Bethlehem, Judah, I'm going home. So her departure from Moab is showing, verse number six, she's repenting of Moab. You've got to turn away from that life, get away from that world. You're saved by the grace of God. You're not going to be happy living the worldly life. God don't want you happy living a worldly life. He wants you spiritual. He wants you living holy. He wants you in a, in a spiritual position where he can open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings. He can't do that. You're living in sin. Moab is a sin place. You got no business living in the world, church. And we don't want to invite it in here in that respect. We want sinners coming, but we want them to come into a sanctuary of God, a place of holiness. Amen? One where God has liberty. So there's a departure from Moab. She repented. She knew that she needed to return. She knows she needed to get back where she should be. Now listen to me. Every one of us sitting in this building or standing as I am in this building this morning know where you are with God and you know where you need to be. The difference is going to come in just a moment when we make an opportunity for invitation You come talk to the Lord, which is open all the time, by the way. You know where you need to be. Why ain't you? Are you just sitting there moping in your Moab? Are you soaking up your misery? Why don't you get where you need to be with God so he can pour out the blessings of heaven? I'm talking about a 
misery that's mended with a miracle from God. God does some miraculous thing here. When you look at the 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 uh, the weeping that went on there in verse nine, they, I mean they're they're in misery. It's a miserable situation. When you begin to deal with your Moab, when you begin to deal with your misery, get back to where you're supposed to be, back to Bethlehem, Judah. Verse 19, she's marred with brokenness. She's, she's, she's marred and in misery of bitterness. When you look at verse 20, she talks about her business, the, uh, b- bitterness. She said, the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. Here's a bitter woman. She's so eat with bitterness that she don't want her daughter-in-laws to come with her. They've been hanging around for a few years, if I understand it right. Seems to me Ruth's a pretty good gal, even though she ain't saved. She's wanting to help Naomi even before she becomes a saved person. That's a pretty good person. But then she trusts the Lord, as we see in the scriptures. You study this out. She's broken. She's blaming others. You know what she tells everybody her reason for her misery is? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord, the Lord had dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty hath afflicted me. She's saying God done all this. Now listen to me. Get get to the truth. She done it to herself. She and her husband left Bethlehem, Judah. She made the decision to walk away from God. She did that. You're not going to get the help you need until you get honest. Don't blame God and don't blame everybody else. Get right with the Lord. That means you accept your responsibility for what you've done wrong. Man, we're in a society today that nobody wants to accept their wrongs. They won't blame everybody else. Amen. Well, I've done that because that's what my daddy done. I've done that because that's the way mama done things. Well, you still made a decision to do it. You had the opportunity to not do that way. There's a, young, there's a young king in Israel that they put in king at eight years old. He is the lineage of Ahab and all that other wicked bunch. Everybody before him kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Hang on. It just got worser and worser. But here comes young Josiah. A youngin' that the Lord used to bring revival to his people. And as long as he was alive, God blessed the nation. After he left, God brought judgment. Captivity, all kinds of terrible things went on. So when you when you begin to deal with your Moab, when you deal with your misery, get get a hold of it. Look at where you're at. You're broken. You're bitter. You're, you're broke. She ain't got nothing. She said, I come back empty. Now that's not all true. Okay, And her perception of where she's at in life is she's empty, she's got nothing. Well, number one, she's got the Lord. Number two, she's got a daughter-in-law that loves her enough to leave her own people and go with her. And if I, re- if I read that right, when two, verse 19, And the two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass as they were come to Bethlehem. Y'all reading with me? that all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi? Looked like she had a pretty good homecoming. Well, she ain't got nothing. She ain't nothing. Nobody likes her. Nobody wants to be around. Oh, she got such a terrible... But everybody come to see her. See, the problem with depression, the problem with bitterness, is their eyes eyes are blinded over. That hinders you from being able to see the trueness of God. What you find in this, here's a delight out of this mess. She got back to God in verse 22. She returns to Bethlehem. Oh, what a wonderful place. Ain't Bethlehem a good place? Oh, little star Bethlehem. You know, no, I'm not singing. She's got a delight when she gets back. Now, let me, let me give you three things. We'll go home. 
One thing we see with her, she calls herself Myra instead of Naomi. They never did. You don't see where anybody in there calls her Myra. She said for them to, but they call her Naomi. She's forgiven by the people. She's favored by the Lord. And she's fruitful by grace. If you read the story, chapter 2, her little daughter-in-law, Miss Ruth, goes out and meets this guy by the name of Boaz, which is grandson to David, right? Pretty good, pretty good lineage there, buddy. For you gold diggers, that's a pretty good catch right there. He's of the lineage of David. But now wait a minute. His mother, wasn't she Rahab the harlot? Do you think he knows anything about forgiveness? Since his mother is Rahab that was a harlot? Think this, think this boy knows anything about the goodness of God? <laughs> Pretty good family old Boaz come out of. Old Boaz one day looks out there and sees that little Moabite daughter, and he said, Whose damsel's this? And they said, Oh, it's that Moabitess girl. He said, Hmm. I don't care where she come from. I don't care who she is, because I know God's a forgiver. See, you can go, you can go from misery to mended when you get back to God's place. Amen. See, God's got help for us. God's got healing for us. God's got hope for us. Because we've got Him. There's always hope with Him. Even when they got a, sto a stone across the tomb, there's still hope. Could you imagine, could you imagine those Marys and, and Martha and all that crowd when they come around it? I imagine, it don't record it all, but I imagine they went to the tomb probably a little more than the, the last day. I don't know that. I just think they would, just knowing who they are. But then they come up there the last day, and she's bringing that, that, that ointment to uh, anoint him with. Now, she knowed it was sealed up, so why did she bring that ointment? She had faith the tomb was going to be open, didn't she? So she gets up there, and the rocks rolled away. My, my, what faith. See, all you need is faith in a grain of mustard seed, and you can move mountains. You got to understand God loves you, period. Zero conditions. God's more forgiven than the people are. God's more favoring of you than the people are. And God will make you fruitful because God is a God of grace. Mercy, He don't give us what we deserve. Grace, He gives us what we don't deserve. Have y'all have y'all read this story lately at the end of the book? You know what you're going to find at the end of the book? You're going to find little Miss Naomi sitting there in a rocking chair by the fireplace. You know what Miss Naomi's doing? Here's a lady said she come back empty. Here's a lady come back bitter. Here's a lady in misery. Don't call me, don't, don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra. I'm a bitter woman. They didn't do that. Here she sits. Little Miss Ruth had this little old youngin'. They got, this, they got this little old baby, and there's Naomi. The Bible says she's nursing this little old baby. She's, she's, she's loving it. She's ministering to this. She's got a real baby. She's got hope. I'm telling you, babies bring hope, don't they? Now, when they get big like David Jung is getting over and they start acting like their daddy, it's, it's a little different. Uh, that's not misery for Miss Kelly. That's mayhem. <laughs> Love you, David. <laughs> Little Miss Naomi, here she is, y'all, chapter 4. She's sitting there with a the little baby. One of the most precious things in the world is get that little young in your arms and love on it. See, she lost a, a spouse. She lost her sons. But when she got back to where she needed to be with the Lord, she was mended. In her mending, she began to work with little Miss Ruth. She gave little Miss Ruth some advice. She told her some things to do. She helped her win Boaz. Wasn't a hard task. 
She helped her win Boaz. And out of that, Boaz. <laughs> oh, this is a good story. Boaz bought back everything she lost. The Bible says he redeemed her. And in redeeming Naomi, now remember, he redeems Naomi to get Ruth. Got to first redeem Naomi because Naomi's from Bethlehem, Judah. Naomi's the one that lost all of her land and stuff. And Boaz says, I'll take care of that. If a nearest kinsman won't do the job, I'll do the job. And there's a beautiful story there. But Boaz takes care of everything. Boaz gives us a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. That as a backslider, even though we've lost everything, when we come home, he has a way of mending our hearts. He has a way of bringing miracles into our life. Things we couldn't dream of. We think that we're hopeless, we're helpless. There's nothing else good coming in life. But that little measure of faith brought her back to Bethlehem, Judah. And God began to mend her. And then in that mending, she began to help little Miss Ruth. Hey, can I give you some help? Even though you're discouraged and depressed, help somebody else. It'll turn to helping you. She helped little Miss Ruth, and out of that package, she ended up with a little old grandson. She gets to sit there and nurse him. You know, Miss Ruth didn't say, no, wait a minute. You didn't want me to come back with you. You don't even like me. You ain't getting my grandbaby. Or you ain't getting my baby. Huh? -uh, no. No, she didn't do like youngins do these days. She said, <laughs> I can see her saying, here, Mama. Look what God's done for us. And through, through that lineage, we see another king come. See, God does total forgiveness. Y'all hearing me? God does total forgiveness. This, this lineage of Miss Ruth is the lineage of the Lord, our, our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the line of David. I think I said that backwards a while ago. David is an offspring of this situation. David comes out of this lineage. Just a day or two down the road, you'll see David's daddy born and then David born out of this particular lineage. Now listen to me. You're talking about a lineage of a harlot by the name of Rahab and a Moabitist by the name of Ruth. That's the picture of forgiveness. Listen to me. Y'all listening? I'm done. When the saved folk got right, sinners get saved. And there's new, precious fruit born. So church, if you're not where you need to be with the Lord today, if you're flirting around in Moab, Get back to Bethlehem, Judah. Get back to God. Get back to praising Him and participating with Him in the bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Take me and eat. When we begin to consume the Lord, when we begin to eat that Word of God, get back to eating the Word of God. Get back to intake with the Word of God, and that will bring you praise. And when you get right, you hearing me, Christian? When you get right, when you get right, God's mending you and God brings miracles. It might be you get a new grandbaby out of it. You might have a, you might have a new child in Christ around the house that you get to praise the Lord for saving a son, a grandson, daughter, granddaughter, friend, when you get mended up right, God will bring forth the fruit. How is it with you today? How is it with you, church? Come on, Miss Angela, if you can come on up, we'll, Brother Rick. We're going to have a moment of invitation. And what that just means is that we're going to just take a few minutes. I know God's dealt with some hearts. I know that. Now it's your opportunity to respond to the working of God in your heart. 
Here's an old-fashioned altar. Come up here and talk to him a little bit. Maybe you've been flirting with Moab and you say, Lord, forgive me. I don't, I don't, I won't, I won't mend it. I won't write. Maybe you're bitter. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you feel like there's no hope. That's all this book carries is a whole bunch of hope. And when we get to Jesus, he didn't give back her spouse. He didn't give back her sons. But he gave her a son. And she put that grandchild in her bosom and held him as if he was her own son. God may not bring back some things that we've lost. But he can bring some things that's as good. That'll mend us up and help us. Here's the question. What will you do with it? Will you go from your misery to being mended by the Lord and enjoying the miracles of God? What you going to do? Let's all stand. Father... All I can say is have your will. Help hearts this morning, no doubt some that need some help from you. Save folk, God, need you to deal with them. Remind them, Lord, you're a forgiving God. You're a God that will give favor. And, Lord, you're a God that will give us some fruit. Thy will be done this morning, I pray, Lord. Should there be one here that's lost and undone that doesn't know you as a personal Savior, Lord, I pray that they'll have faith like little Miss Ruth. And say, even though you've been in misery, I've seen enough God in you that I want that God. I pray that, God, you'll give them faith to come, knowing you'll forgive, trusting you to forgive them and save them. God, will you have your will? Will you have your way this morning? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar's open. Some's already came. You need to come. Come on. Come on. Altar's open. Talk to the Lord a little while this morning. No hurt, no harm, just hell. He loves you. He loves you so much he gave his son for you. He loves you so much that he's drawing on your heart, working in there, and things are pitter patter, and you need to come. Ask the Lord, say, Lord, I just I don't even know what all I need, God, but I just need some help. Will you come ask the Lord to help you? I'm telling you, church, if you'll get a hold of the story of Ruth, it's not just the romance of Ruth, it's not just the redemption of Ruth, but it's also the repentance and the renewal of Naomi. She got back to Naomi as you read the close of the book, that pleasant one. God gave her joy back. Will you come? Altar's open. Come on. While these are praying, nobody's looking. I want to ask you a question this evening. Nobody looking. I don't want nobody looking. Are you in a place like Miss Naomi and you need some help from the Lord? All I'm going to do is if you raise your hand, I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to remember you in my prayers to come. Ask God to give you the help. I'm not going to mention it to you. I'm not going to mention it to nobody else. I'm not going to point you out in any way. All I want is just to be able to pray for you. If you lift up your hand and say, Preacher, I just need some help, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to ask the Lord. I see those hands. Anyone else? Hands all over the building. Be honest. Need some help today? I wonder if there's any here today that you're lost and you know it. You know you need to be saved. You don't have that peace in your heart that if you was to die, you'd be in heaven. Would you let me pray for you today? Raise up your hand just a moment. Anyone here this morning admit you're lost, know you need to be saved? Anyone? Father, you saw the hands that went up today. You know the needs in these hearts. Lord, I pray, please, I can't, but you can. I don't have the wisdom to know what to tell them or how to help them in a lot of these situations, but you do. Father, they've been honest. They've lifted up their hand for prayer. They've lifted up their hand in faith and hope that you're going to move, you're going to help. I pray, dear God, please, honor your word and give them the help that they need today. Father, we'll thank you for it. We ask all these things in the blessed and the precious, powerful name of Jesus, we do humbly pray.